I do believe I am live on Facebook. So let me let my group know. Uh, then I'm live because it's the second Thursday of May. That means it's time for no more genies. Okay. No more genies. Okay, just let my Facebook group group know. And um live now. All right. <clears throat> Tonight, as you know, is the second Thursday. And second Thursday is when we do no more genies. If this is your first time watching me, I'm gonna explain that in a minute, but it's seven o'clock, and I believe we're starting on time, so we're gonna get started and jump right on there. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to come before you and understand more about you, God. Thank you for the revelation. For we do not understand you, God, by intellectualization. It's not our own efforts, oh God. It's only by revelation you reveal yourself to us. So I thank you, Father. I bless your name. Please forgive me for any sin. Wash me clean. Fill me with the Holy Ghost and breathe through me, oh God. I surrender myself to the Holy Spirit. I must decrease so you can increase, oh God. So you take the will and let the words be spoken be what you want spoken to the glory glorifying of your name, that you might be glorified in all things, that the saints might be edified, that the demons might be terrified, and that sinners might be mortified. They might be absolutely mortified to live one more day without you. I thank you, O God, that this word shall echo forth down through time, even after I'm gone, and stand as a testimony where the Spirit of God will begin to minister over and over and over again to lead many to Christ. And I declare and decree that this word will lead many to salvation and cause many to be born into God's kingdom. And signs and wonders and miracles shall follow all that believe and receive this word. I thank you for it, Father. And I'm expecting you to do great things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And for those of you that uh, this is the first time seeing me, uh, no more genies means that we are getting rid of our genie concept of God because so many of us believers have been taught that God is somehow some kind of genie, that all you have to do is rub the lamp. Somehow all you have to do is say the magic words and you're going to get this magic result. It's not magic, number one. Number two, a very strong component of genie concept it's when people believe that the blessings of God come regardless of what you do, that the blessings of God come regardless of how you behave. That is not the truth. That ain't nowhere in the scripture. <laughs> nowhere in the scripture does it ever say where God says, y'all just go and do whatever you want to do and I'm going to bless you anyway. Please find me that. Find me that anywhere in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation where God ever said that. See, that's a genie concept of God. It's a magic concept of God where you think you can just pop your fingers or wave a magic wand or say the magic words and God is just gonna do what you want him to do as if he were some kind of genie. See, all that's wrong. All that's wrong. So I started this broadcast on second Thursday nights and that's why I call it No More Genies because we are not going to continue to operate with a magic concept of God as if he's some kind of genie. We're not going to continue to operate as if we could just say some magic words and things would happen. And we are not going to continue to operate as if the promises of God and the covenant of God don't have anything to do with how we live, that we don't have a part in our own lives. That's why you have to study the scripture. And that's why you have to get to know God for yourself because it is not true, nor has it ever been true, that God's promises happen automatically. This is the problem. Let me just do a little myth busting before we dive into tonight's lesson. Uh, this is the problem that a lot of people have with God, but particularly unsaved people and carnal Christians. Unsaved people are people that are not born again, that have no relationship with God at all. 
because they never accepted Jesus Christ and his blood as payment for their sins. Carnal Christians are people that are born again, but they stayed babies. They never grew spiritually. And so they still think like the natural man. They still think like who they were. And you're not who you were after you get saved, but if you don't renew your mind and you don't grow in your faith, you're still gonna think like that old person. Those are carnal Christians, carnal Christians, carnal like fleshly and worldly. People like that, unbelievers and carnal Christians tend to think that God's promises are just automatic and automagic. And so if the devil comes at you hard or there's some type of tragedy or something that could have been avoided and you haven't talked to God in a year and a half, you haven't talked to God in five years, you've just been, been living your life and all of a sudden comes, something comes upon you. Okay, that happened because you weren't walking in the prophetic. You weren't listening to a prophet and you didn't develop your own prophetic walk with that, with God because the Lord will always warn you. That's one of the biggest benefits about the prophetic is that the Lord will always warn you. The Lord will always warn you. I'm talking to my sister in the chat. So, uh, so the Lord will always warn you, warn you, warn you, warn you before something happens. Uh, if the devil is coming, if judgment is coming, if you are doing something that's going to end up producing death, anything like that, God will always warn you. The Lord will always tell you ahead of time. That's what the prophetic is for. But if you don't have a relationship with God, if you're not saved, then none of God's promises apply to you. That's why, like if the devil takes out your wife or takes out your husband or takes out your son or takes out your daughter, there's some kind of accident or some kind of tragedy or something that happened to you that shouldn't have happened to you. People get mad at God or they blame God. That's not God. God didn't want that to happen. But if you don't have a relationship with God, if you have no covenant with him, his promises do not apply to you. That's what people don't understand. Humans think, that just because you get born on earth, that all of God's promises automatically extend to you. They do not. That is not who God is and that is not how his kingdom works. God's promises work by covenant. You have to come into agreement with God. You have to accept the, the, the payment that pays for your sins, which is the blood of Christ. You have to uh, come into covenant with God. You have to come into agreement with him and you have to accept the conditions of the contract. Then the promises of God are yours, not just because you got born on earth. That's where a lot of people get confused. A lot of people get confused. A lot of people are confused and a lot of people looking at me right now, you are angry with God because something happened in your life that you didn't count on and it was the devil or sometimes things just happen. Sometimes it wasn't Satan. Sometimes you live in a sin-cursed earth. Sometimes stuff just happened. Or you were doing something that was guaranteed to produce death. Any number of things, and then tragedy struck, and then you got mad at God. I stopped by to tell you that is not God. That is not what God wanted for you. But if you don't have a relationship with him, if you're not walking in the prophetic, if you're not before him in prayer, spending time with him every day, if you're not in his word every day, if you have no relationship with him, then you're not going to hear the voice of the Lord. You're not going to respond to the Holy Spirit's leading. And so let me tell you a story. Let's say you're on an island. And to get to that island, you have to take a ferry. And when you're on the island, you're at a casino and you're just a gambler. And you're just a gambler. You're just throwing your coins in a machine. And you're just a gambler. You're just a gambler. And your friend is like, come on, we got to go. And you're like, just a minute, just a minute. And you just a throwing the coins in. And you just, eh, because you think you're going to get them three strawberries. And you just a throwing in. Your friend is like, dude, we got to go. Okay. And you're like, just hold on. Just wait a minute. Wait a minute. And you're just throwing them coins in. You're just throwing them coins in. And it's two hours later. Then you go running outside. And now you're running around on the wharf talking about, I got to get home. I got to go to work tomorrow. I got to get home. Lord have mercy. What happened? And some sailor standing on the barge says, I'm sorry, 
but you missed the boat. Mm -hmm. That's what happens to a lot of people. And that's what's going to transition me into our lesson for tonight. Our lesson for tonight is who is God? Part four. I strongly encourage you to go watch the other three chapters. Okay, because I taught this thing in four parts. Tonight is the last chapter. Who is God? Part four. Okay, now what does that have to do with the story I just told? I'll tell you. A lot of people looking at me right now and a lot of people that are going to watch this on the replay and a lot of people that see this sometime in the future miss the point of 2020. The point of 2020 was God gave us over a year we were isolated, couldn't go to school, couldn't go to work, couldn't go to church, couldn't go to a restaurant, couldn't go to a movie theater. And when we went to the grocery stores, we was fighting, okay, over bottled water and toilet paper. We were shut down. This country was shut down. This planet was shut down for over a year. You know why that happened? Actually, several reasons why it happened. One, one, one of them is because God gave us isolated time to get ourselves together with him. God challenged you and said to you, what if you never shake your pastor's hand again in this life? Do you know me or do you know church? Okay, do you know how to get a word from the Lord for yourself? Do you know how to get a prayer through? OK, God shut everything down so we could have a conversation, so we could talk. So you could check your own life and see if you actually knew the Lord for yourself or did you just know how to church or were you not even worrying about it? We had over a year of isolated time so we could hear what the spirit was saying to the church and us as individuals. And some people missed the boat. You know how I know they missed the boat? Because they're busy trying to build stuff back up that God just tore down. God spent a whole year just tore down everything. And I see people steady trying to build stuff back up. It ain't gonna never be like it was. You understand that? 2020 was a transition year. 2020 is one of those years that split time. There was before COVID hit and there's after COVID. It's split time. Nothing's ever going to be the same. It's never going to be like it was. Ever, ever, ever. That life is gone. It ain't never coming back. And I'm steady seeing people still trying to function as if they're going to rebuild all that stuff God just tore down. Why did God do that to the church? Because all that church stuff we was doing wasn't, didn't mean nothing about nothing. What counts is a personal relationship. How do I know that's true? Haven't you ever met someone that goes to your church or goes to a church you've been to and they're just mean? <laughs> Haven't you ever seen someone that's just mean? They've been going to church for 20 years and they just mean. How are you going to go to church for 20 years and be mean? How is that possible? I'll tell you how. Because you can spend your whole life doing a whole bunch of religious things and never actually know the Lord. One more time, you can spend your whole life doing a bunch of religious things and never actually know the Lord. Prophet Taylor, is that in the Bible? Yes, yes it is. That is found in the Bible in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Let me put that on the screen. Okay. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. I'm up on the screen now so you know where I am reading. All right. This is what it says. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Matthew is, a, is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 7, 1, Matthew 7. 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What did the Bible just say? The Bible said that everybody that think they saved and everybody that think they getting in the kingdom ain't getting in. It's the people that do the will of his father in heaven, the will of father God in heaven. And the only way for you to know the will of father God in heaven, in heaven is to know the three levels of his word, the Bible, which is the written word, Jesus Christ, which is a living word, and the rhema word, the fresh breathe right now word from God, that normally comes through the prophetic. That's the only way you can discern the will of God. You got to know all three. The Lord says, many will say to me in that day, now stop. The Lord used the word many. God has access to all the souls that there are. So everybody that's ever lived, everybody that should have lived, all the miscarried babies, all the aborted babies, all the stillborn babies, all the people that died as children, everybody that died tragically, people that lived full lifespans, people that died in the water, all them corpses in the ocean, it doesn't matter. All the, the souls on earth, all the souls under the earth, in Sheol or the underworld, the hell region, God has access to every human soul that has ever existed. And the Lord used the word many, how many people have existed? How many billions, seven and a half billion alive now? How many billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, sextillions, septillions of people have lived? I don't know. What I do know is that the Lord used the word many. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Stop. How could you do all that stuff in Jesus' name and not know him? Because number one, because his name has power. So when you just call his name, things happen because his name is a name that's above every name. How do we know that's true? Because you can do the same thing with a person's name. You don't have to know the president. You don't have to know a celebrity personally. You don't have to know the principal of a school. You don't have to know the, the, the district superintendent. You don't have to know anybody in power and authority, but a whole lot of people do things and call they name. We call that name dropping. When you networking, when you're trying to get a part of something, okay, you might drop a name. You might drop the name of people that you don't actually know personally but the power that's in their name opens doors for you, changes things. People look at you differently when you say, well, I've worked for this person or I know this person or I was in a group that did this or whatever. Then people say, oh, because of the name, okay? So if our earthly names can have that kind of power and effect, how much more the name that's above every name, which is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That don't mean you know him. So the Lord says many been running around doing a whole bunch of religious things in Jesus name. And the Lord said, depart from me, get out my face. We never had a relationship. That's how you get the phenomenon of going to church with people that you've known for 20 years and they just is mean? How can you know the Lord and just be mean all the time? Because it's possible to do a whole bunch of religious things. The Lord said, some people are gonna spend their 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, yay, even 100 plus years of life on earth, doing a bunch of religious things, thinking that they are part of the kingdom and stand before the Lord and start bragging on all the stuff that they've done. And Lord just going to shake his head. Be like, get out of my face. I never knew you. We never had a relationship. The Bible just told you it's possible to spend your life doing a bunch of religious things and you don't actually know the Lord. 
That was the point of 2020. We kept saying, we kept prophesying that it was going to be the year of full vision, the year of clear vision, the year of clarity, the year of perfect vision. And that was true. It just didn't happen the way we thought it would. <laughs> just didn't look like what we thought it was going to look like. Because God gave every man, woman, boy, and girl on this planet over a year to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with him to make sure that you knew the God of heaven for yourself. Do you understand? If you survived 2020 and you didn't take advantage of any of that isolated time to get to know the Lord for yourself, because Passover wasn't around, because apostle or prophet wasn't around, because a deacon or an elder or a bishop wasn't around, because uh, we haven't been to church in over a year and three months. If you didn't understand the point of that time, it was, was for you to have your own relationship with God, for you to have your own conversation with God, for you to be sure that you knew the voice of God for yourself. If you didn't get that out of 2020, I'll stop by to tell you, you missed a boat. And some people out here steady trying to rebuild a system that God tore down. Why did God tear it down? Was it helping us get to know him? Or was it helping us argue about who's cooking the chicken in the kitchen? Were we arguing about Mama Nelly sits on the second row on the right side and she's been sitting there for 50 years and you can't sit there because that's Mama Nelly's seat? Well, we arguing about who gonna bring past his water out when he's on the stage, when he's out there preaching. It's my turn to bring the water. No, you brought the water last week. You just trying to get some attention because you think you cute. Is that was what we were doing? Or were we trying to know him? Were we trying to glorify ourselves? Did we want people to look at us? Are we trying to draw attention to ourselves? Were we trying to be famous? Were we trying to, to, to get all eyes on us because we thought it was all about us? <clears throat> were we healing the sick? Were we raising the dead? Were we multiplying food? Now you see how when I say that, you see how some of y'all look at me like I'm crazy? So when I start talking about the stuff that Jesus actually did, you think that's crazy. And when I start talking about how there are hood rats and there are club rats and there are ghetto rats, there's also church rats. There's some people that just go from church to church, church because they want the latest gossip. There's something because I know some people like that. There's some people in Chicago that go to different churches, churches based on who the worship leader is. OK, do you think that's how we're supposed to be spending our lives as Christians on Earth? Are you rebuking? wind and rain when a storm rises, can you say in the name of Jesus, peace be still and the weather be calm? Can you do that? What about opening blinded eyes? What about healing lepers? See how when I start talking about the stuff that actually happened in the Bible that Jesus actually did, how how some, some so-called Christians think that sounds crazy because you learned how to church. The Bible just told you that's not the same as knowing God. And some people are going to spend their whole lives and never actually knew the Lord. Why would you spend your whole life on earth and you never actually knew the Lord? Because the Lord just told you all that stuff you brought before him don't even count. I want you to notice that the Lord did not give them partial credit. He didn't say, I give you 20 points on the prophesying and I give you 30 points on casting out the demons and I'll give you, you know, a point and a half on the one. He didn't say that. He said, get out of my face because we never had a relationship. That means all that stuff, that religious stuff you did, didn't count. That doesn't tell you anything. So if you didn't take the advantage of the opportunity of 2020 to make your calling and your election sure, that's a scripture that means that you know God for yourself, that you seek God for yourself that you ask God, am I in your will? Am I doing with my life what you want me to do? If you didn't do that in 2020, after 15 months of isolation, 
I stopped by to tell you, you missed the boat. And if you think that we're supposed to go back to church as usual, see, there's a lot of things. That's why I knew I had to have my own platform because there's a lot of things I couldn't say in other venues. Okay, so that's why I had to have my own channel so I could say them on my own, in my own space. Because, because where are the food pantries? Where are the miracles? Oh, Prophet Taylor, you just running your mouth. No, no, I'm not. In my family, I'm not going to call no names because I'm not going to tell nobody's personal business. But in my family, <clears throat> we had some back-to-back -back miracles where there were some medical situations and we called on the Lord and we saw the mighty hand of God work through miracle power and he changed medical situations twice. I'm not talking about 20 years ago. I'm talking about about two months ago. So don't tell me that God is not still working miracles because God doesn't change. The Bible doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. Don't tell me that God is still not working miracles. Don't tell me that he's not still opening blinded eyes, that he's still not opening closed wounds because he's the God of fertility. Don't tell me that he's not still uh, growing limbs. Don't tell me that he's not still, we're not still casting out demons. That if you're paralyzed, that, that, that you can't walk again in Jesus' name. Yes, you can. Don't tell me that God is still not doing the same things he did when he walked to earth as a man. My question was, is that what we were doing in church? Or when people come in on crutches, do they come in on crutches and leave on crutches? When they come in in a wheelchair, do they leave in a wheelchair? When they come in demon possessed, just as crazy, just as tormented, just as bound by an unclean spirit, do they leave the same way they came? It, were we doing what Jesus did when he walked to earth as a man? Or were we arguing about who had the biggest hat? Uh-huh. Because I know a little something about church folks, and I know this. I know if you park too close to the pastor and the first lady, everybody going to get mad at you. Pastor got his parking space. First lady got her parking space. If you're the next one over and you're not one of their kids, people are going to be like, mm. And they're going to catch your attitude. Because that's the kind of stuff we think is important. That's not in the Bible. Where's your holy parking space? Where is that? Okay. That's the first book of Plantation, <laughs> Plantation 1-3. That's where that is. That's not in the actual scriptures. So I'm asking one more time. Were we doing what the Lord told us to do? Did he said, uh, when the Lord said that signs and wonders and miracles would follow those that believed in his name, that we were supposed to go forth and teach all nations all the things that he had taught us. That the same kind of miracles, like when Peter and John pulled up that man that had been lame for years, they pulled him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Is that what we were doing was my question. Okay, if a couple's trying to have a baby and they're struggling with infertility, can they come to a prophet? Can they come to a man or a woman of God and we go in the spirit and ask the Lord for a fertility blessing and tell these people about this time next year, you're going to have a baby or tell the people why the womb is closed. Get a prophetic word and ask the Holy Spirit, why are they struggling? And the spirit of God tell us, this is why. Is that what we were doing? That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. All that stuff we were doing, that religious stuff we were doing, that's why God tore it down. Because it ain't nothing about nothing. Okay? How is the world going to get healed if the saints don't flow in the healing power of God, don't flow in the miracles of God? How are people that know, don't know the Lord going to see his power if his power is not in operation in us? That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not talking about something I think, and I'm not talking about something that happened 20 years ago, although I've had plenty of miracles in my life directly and in my children's lives. I'm talking about something just about two months ago because God doesn't change. So if you didn't take advantage of that 15 months of isolation, you missed the boat. 
And if you're trying to go back to them old religious systems that weren't doing anything, really you go into a church because of who the worship leader is. And if you don't like the worship leader, you ain't going and you're not going to be faithful in your attendance. Really? Where are the miracles? People getting out of wheelchairs, people surviving car accidents, people that have been blind their whole lives being able to see. I saw a video where a woman, one of her arms was stunted and her arm, her hand was like up here where her shoulder is. So she didn't have a full arm. Her, her hand was up here and they prayed for that woman and prayed for that woman and prayed for that woman and they put oil in that woman and the arm extended and it came all the way out here normal. I saw it. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. Is that what marks us as 21st century Christians? Or are we arguing about parking spaces? Or are we saying that, you know, that that we only want, you know, a mega church pastor, we only want a famous preacher. And if the famous preacher ain't preaching, then, then you know, we're not interested. So that's why I said we missed the boat. And that's why I started this series of Who is God? So part four, I'm going to finish up tonight. I strongly encourage you, like I said before, to watch the first three parts. One more thing I have to say. Uh, now, I'm not going with this where you think I'm going. <laughs> okay. Here's what I have to say. Uh, if you've been hurt in church, I want to tell you that I feel you because I have been too. I don't think there's anyone that's ever been to any type of religious, formal religious institution of any denomination, Catholics, Protestants, whatever. I don't think there's anyone that hasn't been hurt in church at some point. Because I know a lot of churches like to embarrass you. I know a lot of churches like to stand you up before the congregation and put you on blast and a whole lot of things I've seen in church that I didn't think were on the up and up. But what I want to say to you is that church hurt is not an excuse. I know that's not where you thought I was going. What you thought I was going to say was that I was going to justify your pain. Mm -mm. Because the Lord Jesus Christ opens wide his arms. This is why you have to know him for yourself and says, come to me, broken pieces and all. Do you understand that if you are uh, an urn or a chalice or a jar or whatever kind of vessel you are, and you've been broken, the Lord opens wide his, wide his arms and says, come to me, broken pieces is all, broken pieces and all. If you've been hurt by somebody in church, some leader disappointed you, somebody did something to you that they didn't have no business doing in church, somebody tried to get with you that shouldn't have been getting with you in church, somebody embarrassed you or humiliated you or, or told something about your family, or any of that, or you fell out with somebody. Lord, ain't mercy, ain't, ain't no anger like when you fall out with a church brother or sister. When you fall out, because I have made mistakes in church too. I have definitely made my share of mistakes in church. And where I could, I tried to apologize, but sometimes, sometimes the hurt, people just hold on to it sometimes. You have to work through stuff. Sometimes some relationships are never going to be the same again. So again, let me confess my mistakes. I have made mistakes in church too. So I, I don't want it to seem like I'm just talking about it one way. I have definitely made mistakes in church. I have. And so that's what I mean when I say, I don't think there's anyone that hasn't been hurt or cause some hurt. We don't like to talk about that part. We like to talk about what's been done to us, but we don't like to talk about the things that you've done in church that you shouldn't have done. I have made mistakes, most definitely. So I'm going to say it again. I don't think there's anybody that hasn't been hurt or caused hurt in church. But I stopped by to tell you once and for all that church hurt is not an excuse for you not to know God. 
even if you gave up on church, you say I ain't never going back to church again, don't give up on God. I know you never heard nobody say that. Don't give up on God. Okay? Church hurts is not an excuse. It's not an excuse. Let me tell you what else is not an excuse. The other excuse that we love to do, that we love to fall back on, is the devil. The devil is not an excuse. <clears throat> I know that you maybe didn't hear anybody say that before because we spent so much time talking about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but prince it out, principalities and powers, which is right. And oh, the devil is busy, which is right. And the devil walks around as a warring, roaring lion seeking who he may devour, which is right. But even though we have to resist Satan, even though we have to deal with Satan, even though we are tempted by Satan, even though we have to fight Satan, Satan is not an excuse. I'm going to prove that to you once and for all from the scripture, and you will never have to struggle with it again. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5.10, I'm going to put that in the chat. 2 Corinthians 5.10. Okay, put that on the screen. And here we go. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Amplified, that was King James of 2021. Amplified version, for we believers will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, that is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. Oh, for we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive his pay according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been and what he has achieved, been busy with, and given himself and his attention to accomplishing. Okay, that last one I read was the Amplified Bible Classic Edition. There is your proof once and for all that if you are a Christian, even though we have to deal with the devil, the devil's not an excuse. You're gonna to have to answer to the Lord for yourself. Let me show you how sinners don't have an excuse and then I'm gonna move on. Let's go to Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Putting that in the chat, I'm gonna put that on the screen because I want you to see what scriptures I'm reading so you can look them up for yourself. So you can see I'm not just making it up. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, King James Version. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the judgment for unbelievers. That's the judgment for sinners. So Christians, when we die, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Sinners, unbelievers, when they die, they stand before the great white throne judgment of God. And God opens the book of life to show them that he made a place for them there through Jesus's blood, but they didn't accept it. And now they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. What did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just tells you that literally every human is going to be judged at the end of their lives. So whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, whether you are a saint or a sinner, you are going to be judged that means that the devil is not an excuse. We got to fight Satan. We got to wrestle Satan. We, Satan is already defeated. He's under our feet, but that don't mean he's not going to fight. 
we have to stand on the word of God and we have to armor up so we can get the victory. Yes. Because Paul said, for we wrestle. In wrestling, there's some wrestling going on. But Satan is not an excuse. Church hurt is not an excuse. And Satan is not an excuse because I just read you the verses where the Bible says, as believers, we're going to have to give an account for how we've lived. And for unbelievers, they're going to have to give an account to God too. And God's going to show them that they could have been saved, but they chose not. They rejected it. And that's why they're going into the lake. There's your proof scripturally once and for all that the devil's not an excuse and church hurt is not an excuse. You can't use the crutch of the fact that you got hurt in church for the rest of your life to not know God. So finally, let's move on to the final points. Uh, I'll do a quick review of all the other points I went over and we're gonna get to the final points. Uh, part one, I talked about how God's love is unconditional, his favor is unmerited, his mercy is undeserved. Part two, I talked about how his love is not based on how you act and that God's love is not shallow, God will not betray you. Part three, I talked about how God was a gentleman. He doesn't force his love or his grace on anyone, about how we need forgiveness, about how you can't lose your salvation. So tonight, and God's word is unchanging. Part four tonight, I'm going to talk about how God's commandments are love commandments. That is John 15, 9 through 11. John 15, 9 through 11. Coming up on the screen now. Wait, did I type that right? Yes, okay. John 15, 9 through 11. Uh, New International Version. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, <laughs> do you see the Lord is not talking about climbing up the rough side of the mountain? <laughs> do you see uh, how, how we don't talk the way the Lord talks? That's because we don't seem to understand that, understand that God's commandments are love commandments. As the Father loved Jesus, Jesus says, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. See, the Lord is the best kind of leader that there is because there's nothing he asks you to do that he didn't do first. So the Lord, when he lived his life on earth as a man, he stayed in the father's love through obedience because he understood that anything that father says to Jesus had Jesus' best interest at heart. Anything that Jesus says to you he has your best interest at heart. And I've discovered even the Lord's rebuke is love. Because when you study it out in Hebrew and Greek, you find out that word love English is very limited because a part of love is chastisement and rebuke and correction. That's just as much a part of love as warm fuzzies. Because I know we think that warm fuzzies is all love is. No, there's a little bit more to love than that. But even when the Lord puts you in check, even when the Lord chastises you, when the Lord corrects you, when the Lord rebukes you, even that is love. So he says that to remain in his love, we have to keep his commandments. We have to do what he said. That means his commandments are love commandments. Did they teach you that in church? Did they make you feel like what God says to you is because he loves you? Maybe they did, because I know, you know, it's not true in every place, but I'm just asking you to review your church experiences. Did they make you feel love? Did they make you feel like whatever God was saying to you was out of love? Because that's easy to talk about when it's warm fuzzies. What if God says lose 50 pounds? That's love too. What if God says break up with that man? You need to leave that man alone. That's love too. What if God says you better leave that girl alone? That girl ain't for you. That's love too. Do we do that? Do we always do that? What if God says you need to tithe? You need to be offering up your 10%. Every time you get some money in your hand, I want 10% off the top. Do we do that? What if God said that to you? See, God's commandments are love commandments. Okay, they're love commandments. You see that the Lord doesn't talk the way many church people talk. They're always talking about, you know, what they're going through. That's not how the Lord talks. The Lord talked about staying in the Father's love because he knew that everything the Father said to him had his best interest in heart, okay? 
God's commandments are also victory commandments. That is 2 Corinthians 2.14. I'm put that in the chat and I'm going to put that on the screen. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Okay. That says, now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and who make it manifest through us the savor of his knowledge in every place. American Standard Version, but thanks be unto God who always leadeth us in triumph in Christ and make it manifest through us the savor of his knowledge in every place. Amplified, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us spreads and makes evident everywhere the sweet fragrance of the knowledge of him. Now that sounds like winning to me. <laughs> that sounds like winning. Okay. That means that God's commandments are victory commandments. And I don't care what you say. Some of us have lost some battles. Some of us have lost some skirmishes. Some of us have been defeated at one point or defeated at certain times. And do you know why? That means we weren't listening to the Lord. Because if we were listening to the Lord, we would have won. Sometimes listening to the Lord requires denying your flesh, requires denying yourself. Well, all the time, actually, because you have to not do it your way and do it his way. See that? Okay. So God's commandments are love commandments. God's commandments are victory commandments. So what is God's motive? What is God's motive? See, this is where we get in trouble because we don't know why God does what he does. I'll tell you what God's motive is. Love is heaven's motive. That's what. That is John 3, 16 and 17, the most famous Bible verse in the world. And then the one right after, which most people don't know. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Love is heaven's motive. Father sent the son. Father gave the son. The son gave his life. And then the son sent the Holy Spirit back. And the Holy Spirit gives us revelation. He gives us power. He gives us understanding. He delivers us from bondage. He gives us guidance. They give and give and give and give and give because heaven's motive is love. Is that the way you felt in church? I'm not saying you didn't. I'm just asking you to think about it. I'm asking you to think about, do you really know God for yourself? If God tells you something that you don't want to hear, because I've been there, <laughs> would you obey because you believe he loves you? Would you do it anyway? Could you believe he has your best interest at heart? Okay. Love is heaven's motive. Faith is heaven's currency. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean by that? What do you mean that faith is heaven's currency? It means that if you want to get anything in and out of God's kingdom, <clears throat> you are going to have to have some faith. The only way you get anything in and out of God's kingdom is by faith. Now I'm going to read several verses. Hebrews 11 and 6, for without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Luke 17 and 19, this is the one about the 10 lepers that the Lord healed. Uh, verse 18, was no one found except this foreigner to, to return and give glory to God? Verse 19, then Jesus said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Mark 5, 33 and 34. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, this is the woman with the issue of blood, came and fell down before him, trembling in fear, and she told him the whole truth. Daughter, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free of your affliction. Luke 8, 24 and 25, the disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. 
Then Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and they subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith, he asked. Where is your faith? That means they could have done that. <laughs> they could have rebuked the wind. And Matthew uh, 17 and 19, this is the boy with the demon. It started uh, actually Matthew 17 and 18. 19 and 20. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Afterward, the disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Jesus said, because you have so little faith. There's your proof that if you want to get anything out of the kingdom of heaven, it's going to take faith. So love is heaven's motive and faith is heaven's currency. Grace is heaven's gate. The gate of heaven is grace. What do you mean by that? I mean that you can't go in and out of heaven, but by the grace of God. Okay. Can you back that up with scripture? Yes, I can. I wouldn't have brought it up if I couldn't back it up. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 3.20, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In other words, by our own efforts, by our own morality and ethics, by trying to keep the law, nobody gets right with God that way. Titus 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. There's your proof that you can only get in and out of the kingdom of heaven through the grace of God. And if you're trying to get anything out of God's kingdom any other way than by grace, then that is the wrong way. And finally, victory is heaven's result. Good gravy from the name. Victory is heaven's result. Okay. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14 is the passage we quote all the time, but that's where it talks about being above only and not being beneath, being the head and not being the tail. But that only comes if you listen to everything God is telling you to do. You have to hearken diligently unto the commandments of the Lord, your God. Okay, you have to do what the Lord is telling you to do. Then you get to be the head and the tail. Then you get to be above only and not beneath. That sounds like winning to me. That means when you listen to God, you win. Victory is heaven's result. In Psalm 34 and 19, let me read that. Uh, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. That sounds like winning to me. We win. Okay? So let's review what we learned tonight. We learned that... <clears throat> If you missed the lesson of 2020, you missed the boat. It was a ch all that isolation, 15 months of isolation was a chance for you to spend one-on-one -on -one time with God to be sure that you knew God for yourself, to get away from all of those religious traditions that weren't teaching us how to do anything, but be church people. And are we walking in the miracle power of the Holy Spirit? Are we walking in miracles like Jesus did? <clears throat> because the Bible says we can live our whole lives and never really know the Lord. Uh, we talked about how church hurt is not an excuse and the devil is not an excuse because every human is going to stand before God and be judged by the way that we lived. We learned that God's commandments are love commandments. He expresses his love for us by what he tells us to do. God's commandments are victory commandments. He always causes us to triumph. So love is heaven's motive. That's why God does what he does, because he loves us. Faith is heaven's currency. That's the only way you get anything in and out of the kingdom, by believing it. Grace is heaven's gate. You can't even get through the gate of heaven, but by the grace of God. Grace is what opens the gate, not your works, not your family name, not your skin color, not your morality, not your ethics, not your education not what you do and what you don't do. That is not what saves you. Grace, the grace of God is the only thing that saves you. That's what opens the gates of heaven. And finally, 
Victory is heaven's result. So let me conclude by saying, do we really know God? I'm trying to get all the areas of my life into obedience to what the Lord is saying, because I want all that. I want to stay in his love. I want to stay in his grace. I want to increase my faith and I want to have victory in all things. That means I have to be obedient in all things. And we, you won't obey a God that you don't know. That's why we have to get to know him. So that's why I did this four part series to, to put it out there. Do we really know the Lord? We just had 15 months of isolation. Do we take advantage of that time to really know the Lord? Do you really know his voice? Are you, and let me make it practical. It's not theoretical. Let me make it practical. Are you married to the right person? Because I don't care what you say, we struggle the hardest with giving over to God the things we care about the most, our money, our sexuality, our relationships, our, our reputation, because the Lord knows we obsess with what people think of us. Our children, those are all the things that are closest to our heart. Our money, our sexuality, our relationships, our children, what people think of us. Do you trust God with stuff like that? Anybody can trust God with stuff you don't care nothing about. That <laughs> you throwing God up something that you don't care nothing about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your actual heart. I'm talking about in here. I'm talking about do you trust him with the things that mean the most to you? Are you married to the right person? Did you trust him? Did you ask him before you got married, is this the right one? Or did you just pick somebody and said, I'm going to make it work? Do you trust him with your money? Are you walking in the level of finances he wants you to walk in? Do you know what that is? Are you trusting him with your children? Trusting him with your children? Have you turned your children over to the will of God? Meaning that whatever purpose God has for them in his kingdom, you are in line with that purpose. Are you trusting God with your reputation, with what people think of you? Meaning that regardless of what they think of you, you're going to serve him anyway, because you're going to look crazy sometimes following the Lord. You know, sometimes we don't, once again, that's something else that we don't always get in church. You go look crazy sometimes because following God is a walk, is a faith walk. Remember I told you that faith is heaven's currency. The Lord is going to tell you some stuff and there is no sensory evidence. The Lord is going to tell you some stuff and there's nothing your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears, or your sense of touch could tell you. It's just going to be the word of God. And you're going to have to walk by faith, pure faith. You're going to have to believe what he said is true with no sensory evidence, no sensory evidence. And to do that, sometimes go look crazy. But eventually faith becomes sight and the thing you were believing for shows up. Are you walking with him at that level? That's what I'm saying. That's the real. That's why he gave us 15 months to get real. Because if we didn't get real with God in 2020, I read you the scriptures tonight. It's entirely possible to spend your whole life and never really get to know him. And then all that religious stuff you did is not going to count. He's going to tell you to get out of his face. Why would you want to live your whole life just for the Lord to tell you to get out of his face? That's not the response I want from Jesus. I want Jesus to smile when he sees me and says, oh, David, well done because he knows me and he's pleased with the way I've lived, okay? And the only way you can do that is to spend time with him every day, get in his word every day, listen to his word every day so you can build your faith, okay? Speak in tongues every day, charge your spirit, flow in the prophetic so that when the spirit of God is ready to say something, you're sensitive. You can hear what the spirit is saying to the church. That's the only way is to actually have a relationship with him, not play church. You understand? All right. So this is part four of who is God. So go back and watch all four of them. All four of them are right here on my Facebook page. And then for the week is out, I should have them all up on my YouTube channel. I've been kind of behind because, you know, I was having them internet struggles, uh, like from about like Thanksgiving of last year to just like about a month ago. So I've been behind on my YouTube channel, but I'm catching up, but you can always find everything on my Facebook page. Okay. So tonight was part four. So go back and watch all parts because the Holy Spirit gave me that to say, to put it out there, to, to give us some, 
some uh, measurements, some standards to know whether we know the Lord or not. How do you know all that stuff is right, Prophet Taylor? Because I've tested it. I've tested it over decades. And everything I taught you in this Who, Who is God series, I tested it myself. Is God really like that? And the answer is yes, because I told you there is nothing that I'm teaching and prophesying that I am not living. All right. So amen. God bless. Thank you so much to those of you that joined me tonight. That's our time. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for those of you that are watching on the replay. Those of you that are going to watch in the future, 10 years from now, when you watch this video, amen. And God blessing. May the blessing of the Lord be upon you. Signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow this teaching tonight. You're going to get to know God in an intimate way like you never knew before. And the power of the spirit of God is going to begin to flow through you like never before. If you listen to the prophetics and the teaching in this word tonight. All right. Amen. And God bless. Now I will be here Sunday, 2.30 PM, a regular time, Central Standard Time. The one thing I want you to do, remember I told you every video, I want you to do one thing for me. The one thing I want you to do is what I've been saying for these last couple of weeks, share this video, share this video in as many places as you can so that we can have an opportunity to get to know the Lord for ourselves. And we don't end up in that group that did all that religious stuff and did bit more know the Lord than my left you know how to be right. All right. Amen. And God bless. I'll see you Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Amen and amen.